City of Stevens Point Redevelopment Authority Meeting, recorded August 16, 2022. It's uh, 3 p.m. I will they call the Redevelopment the Authority to order. Director will take her own. Slice. Here. Gardner. Here. Nevo. Here. Cooper. Here. Kemeter. Here. Laddick is excused Barrett. Here. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. Number two, persons who wish to address the board on a specific agenda item other than a public hearing must register their request at this time. Those who wish to address the board during a public hearing are not required to identify themselves until the public hearing is declared open by the chairperson. We do not have a public hearing scheduled. Uh, number three, public comment for pre-registered individuals for matters appearing on the agenda. Director, I believe we have one person. It's Nancy Rappi has asked to speak on agenda item number six. Uh, so this would be the appropriate time for Nancy to unmute herself, uh, make her comment, and uh, for the body to listen. Nancy, go ahead. Okay. Hang on one second here. Uh, Nancy Rappi, 925 Smith Street. Uh, I've been waiting for more than a year to see some sort of resolution with respect to the procedures for reporting property maintenance violations. As of just a couple of days ago, I checked again and there does not be seem to be a facility to look up a violation. You can report them, but boy, it's a real challenge to find the GovPilot link in order to do that. Uh, your only other facility is to send an email form to Mr. Cordes. It's been more than a year. I've spoken with two different uh, alder persons, going back to alder person Jennings, trying to find out what was going on, and now Mr. Christensen. And what I heard was that Google Maps doesn't integrate with this new software. I can't imagine that the city was so short-sighted to turn off working so software in favor of something that the public has no access to. So I'm certainly hoping that Mr. Cordes is going to do a presentation that's going to show us how we can actually utilize this because there are plenty of property violations in my neighborhood that do not get addressed. So I'd appreciate it if this was resolved. Uh, more than a year is utterly ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. No other on the uh, list? Uh, no additional. No. Okay, we'll move on to the regular agenda. Approval of agenda minutes from June 14, 2022. I move that we uh, accept the minutes of the uh, June 14, 2022 um, and place them on file. We have a motion. No, sorry. Second by John. I just have a, um, I, I'm listed as present and also present. I mean, I'm a go-getter sometimes, but <laughs> I don't think it's a big deal, but maybe that was supposed to be a different older person that was present here. I don't there know, was, but yes. anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number two, approval of financial reports from March 22. Director, any comments? No additional comments. Uh, fairly straightforward on the Housing Trust Fund uh, account itself. Uh, we'll recommend approval as presented. We have a motion. We'll approve. Dave? Second. Dave. Commissioner Gardner? Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number three, presentation of 2021 audit report by Baker Tilly. Uh, no one from Baker Tilly is on the call, although they were aware that uh, the audit report was supposed to be presented to the Redevelopment Authority today. Um, I suppose we can just table this for now uh, and wait until Baker Tilly is able to attend. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, just consistent with previous years, the Redevelopment Authority is in good financial shape. So reviewing it I didn't see anything that jumped out so uh, I think that's all they would tell us as well so we'll um, postpone action they may pop in during some time on a meeting and we can bring them in at that particular time review of 2022 budget and update on 2023 redevelopment authority budgeting director 
Okay, uh, so we are in the midst of budgeting season, uh, and uh, annually we like to bring uh, the Redevelopment Fund 208 budget uh, to you folks to, to let you review. Uh, typically, this is uh, about 395000 that's transferred from the general fund uh, to uh, our redevelopment program fund uh, that, again, uh, is generally known in the department as Fund 208. Uh, we have historically uh, broken that up to uh, six different categories, the Neighbor Helping Neighbor Grant, Residential Demolition, the Curb Appeal, Housing Modernization, Rental Conversion, and then Program Marketing as well. Um, and, and, and part of it was fund to it was created after the 2017 housing study that said the city should really have direct grants, uh, loan programs available uh, to help address the housing stock in the city of Stevens Point. Uh, and, and so uh, we had created these programs, uh, began implementing them, I believe in 2018, uh, with uh, very little usage, uh, mainly because uh, we hadn't had program outlines uh, for residential demolition, the curb appeal, housing modernization, uh, or rental conversion through the first several years. We did establish the Neighbor Helping Neighbor Grant Program itself, and as the body might recall, a few months ago we actually updated that program. Uh, so if you look at the historic uh, usage of these programs, it's, it's been less than 1% of the total budget. In fact, at one point we had 495000 in 2019 and 2020 budgeted. We had to reallocate about 100000 of that. Uh, towards other programming in 2021 and 2022. Uh, we have seen an uptick in usage of the programs in 2022. Um, uh, you know, through year to date, uh, you know, 10,000 in the Neighbor Helping Neighbor Grant Program, which is significantly higher than what we've seen historically. Uh, and then we do have a $24,000 rental conversion grant, uh, which was also recently adopted by this body that's uh, being utilized. Um, so, tenfold much better shape than and, and usage than we've seen previously but still not exactly where we'd like to see it I mean in a perfect world uh, yearly these funds would be dispersed uh, and it would be replenished by the general fund as well um, so Cameron's from Baker Tilly um, so if you're okay we can probably finish this go back to the Baker Tilly and we'll go back yeah. okay um, and then uh, as we kind of finish up 2022, uh, that's the second line item in the memo. Uh, you know, our projected, uh, we have another uh, 10,000 of usage in the Neighbor Helping Neighbor Program grant. Uh, you know, we threw 25,000 in housing modernization. Uh, Chris will be presenting a little bit on a specific loan program that we're, we're currently actively working on for that. Uh, and then we do have another uh, party very interested in the rental conversion grant itself. So. Uh, you know, overall, a little less than 28% of the total usage, uh, or total budget would be used in 2022. Uh, so last week, uh, Mark Cordes, uh, Chris Clysmith, and I sat down to, to go over the 2023 budget request. Um, city staff has been uh, informed that we'll have a 0% increase in our operating budget this year. And so we, we did keep the total budget at 395000 I am proposing to increase the Neighbor Helping Neighbor Program grant to 50000 from 30000 uh, Since we've upped to the total grant amount, we have seen an, inter an increased interest in the usage of that specific grant program. Uh, residential demolition, we've actually uh, reduced to 40000 uh, as part of the 2023 likely request. Uh, and, and Chris will uh, talk a little bit more in, in the coming months about kind of revamping that program, uh, talking about maybe acquisition and demolition as part of a, a grant, uh, instead of just you know acquiring a property and tearing it down and now you're still 100,000 plus into a smaller city lot. Um, uh, working on updating the curb appeal, housing modernization, and then uh, keeping the rental conversion budget at 100,000 as well. So fairly straightforward. Uh, I do expect to see in 2023 these programs be continuously used. Uh, and hopefully we'll see year-over-year year increases in that as, as we move <coughs> forward. So um, I guess the actionable item would be to allow staff to uh, essentially submit this specific budget for Fund 208 um, as part of our budgeting process. Questions or motion? Question, Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead. Go. Um, doesn't matter. Can't see through his ears. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. 
I guess. Go ahead. Mary uh, made a motion to approve. Okay, that's a motion. Oh, I see. We have a question. I will second with a question. Um, the amount of the housing modernization at a hundred thousand. Um, basically, that's to help remodel existing properties. Is that correct? Well, the the original plan was some type of zero interest loan program for um, large uh, expenses, roofing, uh, windows, uh, things of that nature, insulation, uh, and so. But the problem has been that we've never had a formalized program itself, uh, and that's something that Chris and Mark are working on. Um, one of the challenges that we had was if you do a loan program, uh, well, who's going to do all the, the paperwork uh, for the loan itself, and who's going to be the one that's that's under essentially underwriting the the, the loan itself, um, and then who's going to manage the loan, who's who's going to be collecting the funds annually. So those are the types of things that we are working through. Uh, but keeping that hundred thousand. Think and zero interest loan, where that fund could be replenished over time, uh, would, would be an appropriate thing to keep in the specific budget. Well, my suggestion in the past has been to coordinate with uh, CAP Services to let them <laughs> take care of the management issues, to piggyback on their programs, and to um, help supplement the funding in those programs. And sometimes our money can be used to fill gaps mm -hmm. that their programs cannot. Sometimes they're have restrictions on the use of funds, and I'm not sure what the use restrictions on the use of our funds are any longer. They used to be fairly tight, but I think they've loosened up over time. Is that correct? Uh, generally, yeah. So mm -hmm. Davis Bacon and some of those things are no longer applicable. So <clears throat> in my opinion, I'd like to see the housing modernization upped a little bit. Uh, rental conversion, it's an expensive um, proposition, and I'm not sure how many people are going to be doing it. It remains to be seen whether there's going to be um, whether there's going to be a take on that or not. Um, and so I, to me, I'd like to see housing modernization up a little bit and coordinate with CAP services so that um, they can take care of some <coughs> of the operational issues that you just talked about. That's not necessarily a motion, but I'd like to hear some conversation, and especially maybe from CAP, <laughs> to see whether this would be an appropriate um, because I know you had to hold your program for a while. You put it on hold because of uh, some issues with staffing. Yeah, and and I'm not employed with CAP Services anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, that's no right. longer. No longer. Ah, okay. Well, you you're familiar with the program, though. I you am. Can tell us about I am. So you know, a lot of it had to do, like you mentioned, a lot of it had to do with income restrictions, eligibility issues, and how do those funds partner together? I think that if the city had an idea of what their requirements were going to be um, that uh, an organization like CAP could definitely be in, uh, an ally in that, you know, uh, operate that program and the city then wouldn't be burdened with coming up with additional staff to do that. I don't know if that helps in your question that you were It does. Um, I, let me give you a couple of examples. The, the rental conversion would sink a, fair, a large amount of money into a, probably one project. And, and you have one project would make one impact on one block. Whereas if you replace the roof or a furnace or um, whatever that grandma has that's you know, a fixed income retired person that has no other resources, other than to turn to the city and replace that furnace or replace that roof or replace that um, facility that's going out. To me, that's the target that I'm most in sympathetic in responding to more so than the rental conversions. And so in terms of priority of monies, I'd like to see the housing modernization, call it, not maybe change the name of it, but call it, you know, fix up a house kind of thing. And, and I, that's my target, mm -hmm. more so than the rental conversion. That's, that's my particular yeah, and priority. I think, I think you're right on the money. Uh, <laughs> rental conversion, every, every rental conversion I was uh, part of was over $70,000 for one, yeah. you know, for one conversion. Uh, how often are we going to see a, a a previous owner who wants to turn that back into a single family house. I mean that's a right now with the lack of with the lack of rentals, 
those are cash cows, so they're not going to give them up. So it has to be a situation where, I guess, that uh, becomes available for one reason or another and can be turned into a single-family home. So, so the a good example is the the one rental conversion that, that we've done thus far. It's a, a home that was on that is on Union Street. Uh, it was a rental. It was a duplex rental. Um, of, uh, one of the neighboring properties purchased it. Uh, and actually they stuck a fair amount of money into it uh, and we looked at some of their uh, qualified expenses and came up with the 24000 know, the, Yes, this is something that we could apply <laughs> towards this. Um, and they actually like the home so much that they're selling their house and moving into the former duplex oh. as a single family. So sure. that's, you know, as our first one, it's already the success of that specific program. Um, and we have had more interest with the rental conversion um, as well, I mean, again, we've got another thirty, thirty-five thousand uh, dollar rental conversion grant that we're currently working on uh, for uh, a, a landlord who actually wants to purchase a rental and convert it to his own home. Mm. Uh, and so we are seeing some success there. So I'm a little hesitant because we do offer up to thirty-five thousand in the rental conversion program to simply state, well, we should reduce that whole budget. We do. I mean. We could up it and, and remove money from curb appeal, put it towards housing modernization, if that's where we want to reallocate, because we really don't have a curb appeal grant program um, that exists right now. And that's part of the challenge is, you know, we've, we've identified these five grants, and we really only have standards for two of the five. And that's really what Chris and Mark are working on, uh, and hopefully this uh, October, November, We'll have a, a few more formalized programs to bring forward to the redevelopment authority. Um, but you know, we are seeing some more successes. We're doing a lot more in, in getting the information out there, as Chris will go over later in this specific agenda item. But we do, you know, it's line item budgeting. We can reallocate throughout the year as needed uh, to ensure that you know programs that are being well utilized uh, are continue to be funded, um, as opposed to those who are. Not being well utilized. So, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I second up the motion to adopt the budget. I think your suggestion of um, reallocating during the year as we see success or demand mm -hmm. come along. Let's do that and let's also uh, revisit the specific allocations uh, when the staff comes up with some of the criteria for the, the programs and as they develop. So, I, I'm comfortable with adopting it as it is. Any other questions, comments? I'm curious, I don't know if this is even answerable, but I'm wondering if all of the housing that's being constructed now between the stuff downtown and the Point Motel and the convent, you think that's going to dampen the snap up single family homes to rentals and maybe generate a couple of rental conversions back to single family if, if it dampens that rental market? I, just you know it's one of those that, that who knows right into it right i mean the you you have uh, more supply which would argue that you know the demand would be reduced and the prices would come down on a basic supply demand <laughs> curve right um but for the last several years when you've had historically low interest rates um yeah. it was borderline and, and, and a huge increase of the in the price of homes it would be ridiculous for somebody not to acquire property as a rental uh, and then use it you know, as a single family rental home uh, as an example. Um, I think you're just gonna start seeing now that interest rates are, are starting to climb again, that you will see fewer uh, conversions um, from owner occupied single family to renter occupied single family. But it does get back to the issue of uh, we're still in an environment in which people are waiving contingencies, people are coming in with cash acquisitions. Um, so it's just, it's a very odd time in the housing market and we're definitely watching it closely in the development department. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. off topic a little bit, some of the bigger cities are experiencing um, some of the properties being acquired by out of town people for rentals. Have you seen any of that happen in point? Yes, uh, to a much lesser extent, uh, corporate acquisitions. Uh, but also out-of-town acquisitions. A um, good example uh, are some of our uh, middle-sized apartment buildings. Uh, one would be on the corner of Strong's and Brawley. Uh, a gentleman from Arizona or California bought it sight unseen uh, because they have to bury their money somewhere, essentially, and that's what he told me on the phone. So 
Um, they're, they're doing these exchanges uh, as a way to prevent paying property tax, or I'm sorry, income That's capital gains tax too. as part of it. Uh, but we're seeing a lot less than see. some of the suburbs uh, around some major metropolitan areas. And during the year, since it's all in the same fund, it's relatively easy to uh, reallocate to the different accounts. So I think that would work. Any other questions? If not, uh, you want to roll call or just a voice? Um, a voice is probably fine. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Going back to uh, item number three, presentation of 2021 <coughs> audit report by Baker Tilly. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep, we'll see you. Can you All right. Um, I'm going to do the best to share my screen so you guys have a, a frame of reference. Um, my name is Cameron Sawyer. Um, I'm the manager on the financial audit for uh, the RDA. Um, been on the audit the last four or five years. I've been presenting um, with you guys the last three. Um, so all good news to present this year. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know. All right. Uh, so the, one of the two documents that I'll be showing you, um, you should have a document in front of you that says the communication to those charged in governance. Um, this is a required report for us to communicate uh, to the board. Um, this document, you'll see if it was included in your packet, will define um, our results on our inspection of internal control. Um, you know, as a reminder, uh, for, for our purposes of our audit, it's not our responsibility to detect fraud. Um, however, it is our um, responsibility to make sure that we are examining controls that would reasonably prevent uh, any fraudulent activity. Uh, as well as to ensure that the financial statements are uh, clear of financial misstatement. Um, that being said, you know, during our inspection, the only material weakness that was identified was uh, the weakness, material weakness of internal controls over financial reporting. Um, that is a result of the authorities' um, lack of ability to prepare the financial statements. On top of preparing the financial statements, that would also require somebody uh, to independently review the financial statements that were prepared. Uh, it's a very common finding for an entity the size of the authority. The other finding that we had as part of our report um, is a lesser finding, um, and it's a finding that's been carried forward. Um, as everyone is aware, information systems continues to have more and more of an importance um, and so we have just documented that the current controls that the city has, and they are working on this, um, don't meet the, the minimum best practice uh, requirements. So um, this is also very common for entities the size of the authority. Does anyone have any questions on the control piece? No. no. All right. Going forward to the financial statements, um, it was another good year uh, for the authority overall. Um, the authority really um, made it through the pandemic um, with as little little to no um, impact. Um, this year, you will, um, you know, first off, we, you know, the you have the highest uh, form of audit opinion that we can um, provide to to an entity, which is an unmodified opinion, um, which states that everything in the financial statements are materially correct um, as expected. Um, as we kind of looked at the overall performance, uh, the authority did collect a, a large receivable this past year. Um, so in the management, um, management analysis, you'll see cash went up by 536,000 compared to this time of 2020, um, but you'll see a lot of other things decrease um, so that other current asset was a large receivable that was collected during 2021, which certainly helped the cash position. Um, capital assets really was only decreased by um, current year depreciation. Um, and current liability stayed mostly the same, which would be your, your, your accounts payable. Um, a more 
important or more um, kind of p better picture of what happened this year is, is the income statement. Um, Non-operating revenues, which uh, would be your investment income, this did have this was impacted by the pandemic as well as market conditions declining towards the end of 12, uh, 31, 2021. So you see about investment income really decreased by about half. Um, however, the authority has not typically re relied solely on that at, for income um, and has built quite a bit of a cushion. And, and as many that are on the call may have known, market conditions have improved um, and the authority did not sell stock or stock or other securities at your end. So it would be my expectation that the 2022 audit would show some recovery of additional investment income to kind of make up for the decrease in 2021. Um, another line item that uh, we've, we've seen or has, have has historically seen as a, a, a bigger expense uh, or non-cash expense uh, for the authority is this loss on disposal of assets held for resale. Um, typically, the authority has purchased land um, with the intent to resell for a dollar or at a very discounted price um, because that um, assumption is made uh, when land is purchased, it has to be written down to lower a cost or fair market value that we would sell it for. Um, so you'll, you'll see a, a relatively consistent uh, write down uh, on um, assets held for resale. Um, so overall, that decreased position this year for uh, by about one hundred and twenty two thousand um, dollars, which was about consistent to where the authority thought they would be um, when you include that loss on the disposal of assets held for resale. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now and open the room for any questions specific to the financial statements. Any questions? There does not appear to be any questions. All right. Well, thank you everyone for letting me have time in your meeting to discuss the financials. Um, we appreciate that you know you continue to utilize Baker Tilly as your auditors. Um, look forward to talking to everyone next year. Sounds good. Thank you. Mike. We get a motion to accept the audit report and place it on file. Jean. I'll move that we accept the audit report and place it on file. Second, anyone? Second, Dave. Thanks for coming. Discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, moving right along. Number five, presentation and update from city staff on marketing efforts <coughs> and program efforts for redevelopment authority programs. So uh, first off, if you haven't had a chance to meet uh, Chris Kleismith, uh, he joined our staff uh, a few months ago as our neighborhood planner, economic development specialist. Uh, as this body might recall, uh, a portion of my salary is paid for now out of the redevelopment authority for the next few years uh, to help subsidize this specific position. Um, and uh, I think already, and we, we talked about a little earlier with the, the budgeting and seeing the increase in our programming uh, that it's uh, started to show itself as a successful position. So um, we've been really happy that Chris has joined our team. Previously, he came from uh, Create for Inch County, uh, where he was a project activator. He has worked in um, the planning world uh, previously with the city of Eau Claire, uh, we're looking at urban planning from the, the health aspect. So um, Chris is going to do this presentation uh, with you folks, and I encourage you if you haven't taking a minute to talk to Chris and introduce yourselves would strongly recommend that so thanks Ryan uh, pleasure to meet all of you who I have not met I see some familiar faces in the room um, and since uh, moving into the position with the city um, been really excited to help manage these programs and, and increase their utilization um, since homeownership is such an important part to to our economy um, since Starting within the position and, and taking a look at these programs, I wanted to reevaluate the programs quickly to see if there's any room for some slight modification. Use those, uh, use that reevaluation to inform our marketing procedures and policies for those programs, and then start to update and publish our policies for the remaining programs. 
Um, so, so far since moving into the new position, we quickly reevaluated the Neighbor Helping Neighbor and Residential Demolition Program and published, uh, published the uh, guidelines for the Multifamily Rental Conversion Programs. And we use that information to um, release a, a press release to um, increase some uh, awareness of the programs right away. Um, we've also used that those uh, revisions to develop a brochure also for our marketing efforts. Um, and right now we're in the process of overhauling the residential demolition programs uh, such that it, it um, quells some of the concerns of local developers who don't see the program being useful for them, uh, especially given the, the tight housing market right now. Uh, and we're in the process right now of constructing the housing modernization loan program. Go to the next slide, please. And so far, um, after reevaluating the neighbor helping neighbor and residential demolition grants, uh, we compiled a, um, a list of um, poorly rated or very poorly related um, houses or housing within, within the community, so those could be direct, directly mailed. And as our assessor's office is in the middle of a reassessment, if they um, uh, are aware of any uh, very obvious uh, exterior um, concerns with a, with a home, um, damaged siding, damaged roof, damaged windows, um, they do have a, a stack of letters to leave with um, potential properties. So we are doing a, a very direct approach to um, announcing these programs and making sure that the community is aware of them, hopefully identifying some of the homes that um, would most benefit from these programs and so that way they have direct access to them. Um, we've also updated our press release schedule internally for the, for the department so that we are keeping track of when these programs are being announced, updated, and refreshed, and making sure the public is aware of that. Um, so that's internal to our department, and um, it's on, on my responsibility to keep that updated. We've also com compiled in a, a list of contractors, mortgage lenders, uh, real estate firms to announce any of these updates, and they will be receiving some of the documents that we've recently um, produced. Um, that list is um, fairly comprehensive, but we'll be open to more uh, recommendations if there's a profession or field that you would expect us to be communicating with. And we've also hired CAP services to translate some of these physical documents to Spanish and, and Hmong so that all of our community members have access to the programs uh, on equal or level playing field to access those. Um, I just got word um, this morning from CAP, uh, received all the documents, I have to make some modifications, so we'll have those ready and we can start announcing those to, to our outreach list. Um, the Hmong American Association of Portage County also uh, reached out back to me today um, to ask that we do a formal presentation uh, with their constituents and we might make that a full community um, presentation and, and discussion. Uh, we're already seeing some results of the, of the work. We've had three inquiries um, since the, the public publication of that press release for the Multifamily Rental Conversion Program. One of them was successful and they will receive $24,000 in reimbursement to, to their um, home renovation. Um, one of them is in process and one has been paused. Um, they are still in process of acquiring their property. Um, Mark Cordes has also received some uh, inquiries about the Neighbor Helping Neighbor program. There's been two successful applications this year. Uh, one is pending and we've had two inquiries. So we're seeing uh, an increase in communication about the programs, um, working through uh, some of the hiccups with the new programs and the new guidelines that we published for the multifamily conversion. Um, and we're looking forward to um, next uh, updating the guidelines and the program for the um, modernization loan program I'm looking forward to working with Dave on um, some information there and would like to open that up for discussion. One of the things too that uh, we've, we've seen some success in is uh, just media interest. Uh, you know, we issued a press release, Channel 9, and I think Channel 7 also came down and did an interview with the mayor on the specific programs. Uh, so, you know, it, it has uh, certainly become far reaching and just like uh, when you get some of that media out there, we, we get a lot more inquiries as a result. So um, it's, as Chris has already said and I've shown in these results, it's already been pretty successful in marketing efforts. So When you leave stuff to, on a, to a house that needs the repair and that type of thing, you just go to the resident of the house or to the owner if it's different or both or how do you handle it? Right. How many times do you approach that particular property? 
So the inquiries that I've received, mostly for the multifamily rental conversion, and Mark can maybe speak to the Neighbor Helping Neighbor program, they've all been homeowners who have asked for a, what we call a pre-application meeting or call, um, to go and visit the property with the property owners, uh, document all of the expected um, improvements, uh, modifications to return it back to single family status or design. Um, so usually attend in that one meeting and then throughout the process um, they are required to file building permits and have those um, evaluated. Okay, that's for the people that are asking how are you approaching if any uh, to the homes that need some repair that aren't asking but to get them the information. Sure so um, direct mailing we are we're not going there physically in person but we are sending out a direct mailing to those properties that are rated poor or very poor and then our assessors as they're going through the reassessment they if they notice any gross uh, um, any obvious damage to the exteriors um, they they leave a, a public note um, for them so we we're, so uh, we're going through a reval uh, starting actually this month uh, so the assessors will be out uh, going to each home in the city of Stevens Point, uh, taking photos, doing measurements as they're able, uh, sending uh, direct letters asking for the ability to go into the home to do the inspection to uh, assign it a, a specific property rating. Um, and one of the ways that we can do it through Market Drive, which is our assessment program, is we can do mail merging for uh, homes that have an exterior that's rated poor or very poor. And, and from that, we can say, okay, you know, this home on Portage Street will be getting a letter uh, that's owner-occupied, as because most of our programs do require owner-occupancy as a, as a condition, uh, outlining the programs and encourage them to reach out to staff to talk about their options if they have an interest in pursuing those programs. So uh, some that we have not really done previously, I mean, this is us going out and, and finding um, homes that could be eligible for the, the type of grant programs that the Redevelopment Authority has. Uh, what we've done historically uh, is when a letter gets sent to a property owner because uh, their home needs to be painted, the, the paint is chipping or the roof is in poor shape, we've included historically just a flyer with that uh, and, and had pretty minimal uh, usage from that. Um, you know, most of the time we get a letter from the city, they don't also want to read past the, uh, the letter itself and then read into what programs we offer as a community. So uh, these are very specific, very targeted uh, mailings. Uh, and then uh, hopefully doing some type of follow-up uh, once those property owners contact the city and ask for the pre-application meeting. Other questions? Comments? Alrighty, thank you for the update. You. No action is needed. Uh, presentation by city staff on building maintenance violations procedures. Okay, so uh, Mark Cordes, who's our Neighborhood Improvement Coordinator, uh, is, is here, and he's going to be handing out uh, to the Redevelopment Authority a flowchart that the city produced a few years ago um, in an effort to help uh, better understand what steps the city takes and our, our inspection department takes when a violation notice has been issued or needs to be issued. Um, I will say Nancy spoke earlier. Uh, we have been working with GovPilot to uh, uh, better, uh, well, to get the program itself up and, and, and running so that there can be uh, complaints uh, filed an, uh, anonymously or if you wish to do it against your neighbor, uh, not anonymously. Um, the issue that we've been running into uh, was uh, we came into GovPilot uh, about two years ago for our inspection side and our uh, code enforcement aspect. Uh, and there was some turnover at GovPilot, and then they did a massive uh, back-end changeover. And unfortunately, because of that changeover, we were in the old back-end, uh, and they had pretty much stopped servicing the old back-end. Uh, and so we had pretty much required them to move us uh, to the, 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 the newer front-end, which is more user-friendly for us and uh, easier for them to manipulate uh, the specific program. They have successfully done that. Uh, it is very likely that the online portal uh, that Nancy spoke about uh, will be going live uh, September, October this year, uh, in which anyone who wanted to um, file a complaint against a property, uh, express concern about a property, can do so through the online portal. 
uh, anonymously if they so choose. So uh, just to answer Nancy's uh, earlier question, we know it's been frustrating. We, it's been frustrating not only for city staff, uh, but for our residents. We have really been trying to address that, but we didn't want to make the program go live and have it be full of bugs. Uh, and that was unfortunately uh, what we were faced with as we went through the process of ensuring that it was a, as smooth of a process as possible. So up until the program goes live, we do encourage um, uh, property owners who uh, have concerns about a neighboring property to contact Mark Cordes directly uh, and you can ask for uh, you know to be anonymous and, and we can respect that uh, as well so uh, but Mark uh, if you want to uh, Mr. Chairman before Mark makes his presentation um, I find this very interesting <laughs> but I'm not sure it's I don't see the relevancy to the redevelopment authority um, this is a city issue, city staff, city council, and I'm not sure why it's on the agenda and why we're dealing with the topic. And well, it's on the agenda because I requested it based on uh, how are things triggered with building issues, not the weeds, not uh, that type of thing. But it, if there's houses we got around in the city that need uh, work, uh, is it just done by complaint? Is it done by observation when city staff is going by? The other ones there, I wasn't concerned about. That's the inspection department's area, but the building itself and the homes. Well, let's assume, let's assume that my house is in poor repair and Mr. Cordes comes in and gives me an order to do something to the house. That doesn't come to the redevelopment authority. That issue goes to the city council. And I'm not sure why this is before the redevelopment authority because there's, for the public, I think there's an expectation that we somehow control this and have some responsibility when I don't think we do. Well, I was looking at it, how, is this another vehicle or how is it happening that we can get information about our programs out to these people to fix these and, violations? And, and, and you've already heard that that's in process. I, in that, process that's a good right? idea. I, 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 it's a combination. I applaud that. But the presentation that I think we're about to hear doesn't affect us and we have no authority over it. And I'm wondering, again, I'm worried that the public has an expectation that we somehow control this topic and I don't think we do. And we don't want to. And we don't want to. <laughs> well, I, I, we, don't want, we don't want split responsibility. The council is the one that's responsible, the council that would deal with the issues that Mr. Cordes is going to talk about. I don't know the relevancy to the redevelopment authority, but correct me if I'm wrong. And, I, and if, if we don't have a responsibility, I don't want the public to think that we do and somehow get frustrated again that we are somehow inactive. And so correct me if I'm wrong whether we have this responsibility or not. General code enforcement is not the responsibility of the redevelopment authority. Um, the, and I think we're, the chairman was, was trying to get at is what what is in theory the process and, and honestly I think this is a good opportunity for education anyway uh, but you know as an example a roof that's in a deteriorated shape what is the process for city staff to issue uh, the orders uh, how long do we work with those specific property owners and maybe that's what we want to talk about the specific major projects uh, if if the authority wishes to continue forward with this conversation um, the, the bigger, more expensive projects, as opposed to, uh, you know, obviously grass noise and items at the curb. I, I don't expect that we would talk about that tonight. This flow chart exists um, as, as just a, a standard policy document within the department itself, uh, but major uh, building violations, uh, we, we can definitely talk about uh, if, if the authority so chooses. And a perfect example is the person that voiced their concern at the beginning of this meeting right we have no control over that that's my point exactly that yeah. there's an expectation that somehow we're going to fix it and we if we wanted to we couldn't because it's not our responsibility and so there's that inference well, that somehow we're, we're letting the ball drop when in fact that's not our ball to play with and she referenced city inspection several times right so I think she knows where it's supposed to go but then shows this venue right right as a chance to air the grievances right and as, as mr Ch as the chairman said we can be a resource to help correct those issues but we are not the one responsible for correcting it we are simply the resource to help that person 
come up with the uh, uh, money to fix something, but that's the programs that we're going to be talking about next year, not necessarily right now. All right. What I was looking at is, okay, what happens if <laughs> staff sees a violation? Does it go any farther than that? Is there something that the redevelopment authority programs can do? And yes, we're working on that. Yeah. But up to this point, we really don't know what they were doing at this point. When they spot something, is it kind of like, I'll issue your ticket and yeah, we're not concerned about giving you an option for getting this thing fixed through a program, but again, we're the resource. It should have been two in the same agenda item, but that's hey, information is always good. Go ahead. Well, I but not on I, ice. No, yeah, yeah, no, we? no, yeah. I, I got it. I wasn't. So that, again, this is a standardized document, uh, and I think what I'll do is is this: just give you a brief overview how some enforcement things have changed relative to the redevelopment authority and, and the programs you offer and how those programs have changed just very recently based on our feedback from uh, people within the community. How does that sound? All right. Because then, then you can see how everything ties together. Because we don't operate in a vacuum. You know, everything, everything should tie back together. So when I started in this position, very standard uh, violation, roofing, siding, whatever. City would send out an order. Typically, you only get 30 days to correct it then you continue to get fines. Um, I picked that up, kind of adopted it, then looked at it very quickly and said, you know what, how many people can afford to spend you know, 10 grand on a roof with 30 days notice? Not very many. So the first thing I did was say, all right, we're gonna give people a year. We saw our compliance rate skyrocket. I mean, it was a risk because we had to wait a year to see if it would work out. But ultimately by giving people a longer period of time for major expense items, we saw compliance dramatically increase. So the other thing is we started with a neighbor helping neighbor grant. The feedback we got from that was a couple of things. Well, number one, it's income based, so that limited the number of people. It was limited to $1,000, so we've made a change in that. We've increased it to 5,000. The other thing, the other feedback we got from people was we can't include labor costs. And when we originally started this program, the idea was it would fund a portion of uh, what somebody wanted to do, kind of a handyman special. It would fund their uh, materials, but they'd have to provide the labor. So some of these people were handicapped, some were elderly, and they said, listen, we can't do the labor, can you fund a portion of the labor? So that's why we made the changes to that program. We'd cover that on a 50-50 basis beyond the initial $2,500 for materials, another $2,500 for their labor or materials if they would match it up, up to a total of $5,000. And then that led into you know, kind of us looking at this, this loan program for the people that didn't meet it based on the income criteria. So it, it's all kind of building off of each other based on feedback from people we're getting when we send out these notices. The other thing is, as Ryan had mentioned, one thing we started doing when I would get uh, exterior uh, violations, I would include a little, a little note in there, as Ryan had mentioned, that hey, we have these programs. Again, a lot of people were interested, didn't qualify, dollar amount wasn't enough. So we're making changes. Unfortunately, the wheels of government tend to move slower than many people would like, but I think we're definitely going the right direction. Bringing Chris on board is great because now we have somebody that can kind of spearhead this, you know, get word out into the community. But you know, to answer your question, we try to make people aware of this. We try to be sensitive to the timelines, that, especially now with COVID. We understand contractors are in short supply, materials are in short supply, and we want to try to make these two things work together. The last thing I'll add is something we're looking at that the city of Racine has done. It's called a neighborhood improvement plan, where we target specific areas, and we actually go out and do inspections in those neighborhoods. We don't send out notices of violation. We send out notices that say, hey, we noticed your house may need this, may need this, that or this or whatever it is, they're not necessarily in violation of the code, but we want to let them know that in a few years they need to be looking at these things. And those are the perfect opportunities because these are targeted areas where then we make them aware of these, these grant and loan programs. So that's what this is leading toward, and that's actually going to be coming out toward to the, um, uh, uh, we'll be rolling that out this fall with approval of the committees, these neighborhood improvement plans. And I have what Racine has done, and it's worked very well for them. Again, nobody likes getting anything from the city, but if they get something that's not really, hey, you have to do this, hey, we noticed this, and you know what, we have these programs also available. So that's kind of where this is going, again, based on feedback, and now with having Kristen Board allows us to do more things within these kind of targeted neighborhoods that you know, have the housing stock that needs some updating. With that, I, I mean, I'll answer specific questions, but that, in a nutshell, I think gives you background on how things have changed in the direction we're going, which is, I think, what you're looking for. I was looking for. Thank you. Questions, comments. I, I do like the idea of targeting neighborhoods and you know getting to those people in advance to let them know hey, your you know your roof is bad. Mm -hmm. 
it's going to need replacement or it's going to be leaking um, you know things like that help help the you know the householders so so oftentimes uh, people who know their roof is bad they just haven't had the fire lit under them to get the, the project mm -hmm. done if the city's proactive and, and, and majority of the time government's reactive not proactive but if we have the ability to go out and say hey you know we've got some concerns about your roof you know just FYI we are going to be watching it that might be the, the the catalyst to get them to get that roof replaced and, and you know, bring the house up to a, a you know a better maintained standard as an example but as Mark said like the neighborhood improvement plans uh, would not be they would not be receiving letters saying you must fix it it's more or less our community development staff going out and saying we've got some concerns please work to address this in the near future before it gets to the point of where we're issuing violation notices yeah the other thing i'll add is by the time we send a notice out for paint or roof i get very few people that argue with me that it doesn't need to be done because if i look at a roof and think it's failing it probably is already failing or leaking because you can observe it from the outside there's, there's bigger issues going on so i get very little in the way of, of negative feedback other than people call yeah i know i got to get it fixed and some people actually be like yeah thanks for sending me the order and things like that and and so um you know it's kind of the frog in boiling water we have been doing i i you know every year i go through every every street on the city and and we take a look at every property and um that has uh, changed some of these neighborhoods but it's been little by little where some of these problematic properties have, have kind of changed over time so these neighborhoods have gotten better there's still more we can do again within targeted areas so that's the goal kind of moving forward to this fall and to tie everything back together so so it is is tied back together not only saying hey there is potentially an issue but here's some solutions for you because being government we just don't want to say here's the problem without having some possible solutions good glad to see you're being proactive working toward it other questions comments all righty no action needed thank you uh, number seven possible issuance of a request for proposal for municipal lot number eight parcel number two eight one two four zero eight three two two oh oh four two zero and four two one director okay uh so we have uh this is a lot known as either the want a lot or lot number eight municipal lot eight um as you can probably guess the original live work project on lot number eight uh it, it has not gone forward uh at the time uh, it was just a struggle to get uh, financing uh, from a bank uh, and it's a higher risk project uh, something we haven't seen in this area uh, or even in wisconsin as it relates to live work but um so that kind of went by way of the, the, the wind through COVID. Um, of course, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we actually took about a dozen high impact developers uh, from Milwaukee, Chicago, Madison, and the Fox Valley uh, in partnership with the city of Wausau. Uh, we did what's called a, a familiarization tour uh, where we entertained them for a few days and took them to various sites and talked about development opportunities within uh, Stevens Point and the Wausau area. Um, and so we did utilize uh, parking lot eight as, as one of our, our premier sites. Uh, we also included uh, the Edgewater Manor site, uh, the public service site, um, and uh, the formerly Cooper Motors site as kind of our, our four main uh, opportunities. Uh, but from that, uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, in lot number eight. Um, when the north side yard project was was going on and the live work unit uh was was kind of in the development process city staff uh platted the block uh between second street uh center point drive third and portage street uh and included the alleyway that goes from second to third um and then as part of that we actually put uh, uh the overhead uh, electrical wires underground and through that alleyway and so at the time it made sense because of the development plans that were there however um, obviously that's presented some development challenges that we were more or less self-imposing um, you can't build a home over or any type of property building over the alleyway itself so because of that the uh, uh, electrical utility that's in, in underneath it so the alleyway as far as city staff is concerned will always remain an alleyway uh, there are other ways for us to uh, you know gather additional land for uh development opportunity municipal lot number eight 
Uh, so you can see that we've identified uh, the area of the Second Street right of way, the small triangular piece, as an opportunity for redevelopment. Uh, relocating this water would be fairly straightforward. Um, and you know, in the Second Street right of way here around the lot, that gets us just uh, 1.32 acres, give or take. Uh, the bigger challenge here, um, and part of the reason why Municipal Lot 8 was uh, retained for the Wanta development plan was there's a very large uh, storm sewer pipe in here that's about 84 inches in diameter. It's one of the largest in the city. To relocate it into the second street right of way, it costs, uh, <coughs> would be about a million dollars. Um, and so the question would be, you know, it, it, it just very strategically goes in the middle of that parking lot. Um, and as uh, a good rule of thumb, we've always had a desire for whatever development goes here to be front loaded. Uh, i.e., uh, you know, building right along the right of way or within five feet of the right of way. Uh, there is no way for us to do that with this uh, storm sewer there. Um, so the, the opportunity would be to issue a request for proposal, include this as part of the RFP process, but make sure that there is enough uh, uh, increment generated from a project here that would cover the cost to relocate this into the center point drive right of way um, and this is just the, 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 the total estimate that was included in your packet to relocate that specific uh, stormwater pipe. Uh, so this is within uh, tip number 10. It's also within a qualified opportunity zone census track uh, which uh, has a lot of folks very interested uh, in, in uh, doing a, a Q, uh, QOZ um, project. Uh, so that would be like you know, angel investing essentially, these large conglomerates provide money to developers to do projects in qualified opportunity zones uh, as a way to offset capital uh, tax requirements. Um, of course, it's adjacent to our downtown on the waterfront parks, uh, and because it is in a newer TIF, uh, there's plenty of life left in that TIF district. For those watching at home or who are any more confused about where the specific property is, uh, this is Great Northern Distilling. Uh, this new, uh, their new uh, building is going uh, just north of this, um, or Kim's Barrel Inn, depending on whichever one you want to look at, uh, is also in the corner of Second and Portage uh, and within the block itself. So um, because we have had about three folks interested in, in, in possibly doing a project here, staff is leaning more towards the issuance of a request for proposal, uh, but obviously uh, if you want us to forego that process and just work uh, with a specific developer, uh, we can definitely do that as well. But if you do decide to go through the RFP process, we would likely put that together, uh, present it at the uh, September, October meeting, issue it, and then hopefully have a project lined up ready to go uh, for your consideration in December, January. So, Commissioner, Brian, your thoughts? Oh. Um, does this, is this pipe part of the old slough? got to be because yeah. of, you know yeah so it, it, the slough is filled in this pipe as you can kind of see in the directional goes back towards center point and that's because essentially the dam prevents that pipe from gravity feeding towards the Wisconsin River so it actually goes back on center point down Rogers Street and then down uh, Church Street or Pine I can't one of the two Underneath the dam were, were uh, daylights. It goes down Wisconsin. Street. Uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yep, sorry. Yeah. And Wisconsin. So there's a very large, uh, I mean, 84 inch diameter pipe, pretty much. I mean, I lived on the corner of Clark and Rogers, and that pipe went right next to my house on Rogers Street. So. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, I've seen photos of when that pipe was constructed back in the 30s. And there's a lot of garbage that went on either side of that pipe. It was just very poorly <coughs> filled. So if you haven't included over excavation, you should, mm -hmm. because I, my suspicion is you're going to have to, you're going to really have to over excavate, because when that was filled, and you've got the photos in your office, um, <coughs> it was literally just local garbage that you used to fill in the slough, and then they put the, uh, around the pipe. Mm -hmm. In fact, that might have been why Jerry's service station was sinking, because it just, the, all the fill in there is, I think, settling over time, and I think you're going to see more of that. I wouldn't be surprised if that parking lot disappears. Uh, it needs, settles on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, so include that, number one. Number two, 
What would it take to, what, what kind of improvement do you need to offset that million dollars? Um, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, my suspicion would be if it, you know, we include that as part of the underwriting of a, of a TIF deal, um, you know, a five, six, seven million dollar project would be more than enough to offset the, the relocation costs over okay. time. <clears throat> and you think that five, six million, seven million might fit on that site? Yeah, a good example would be, I mean, this is just over an acre, but uh, probably the three-story apartment complex you've got uh, likely going to start uh, adjacent. I mean, that, that will probably end up coming in somewhere around six to eight million in, in uh, new value. And so because of that, you know, if you take that same footprint and apply it here, it actually it fits. Um, but, you know, each developer is going to do things a little differently in what they submit. It comes back to parking again. Then thirdly, my, my, my third comment was, it says city owned. Is the RDA owned this or does the city own it? Uh, it is RDA owned. Uh, RDA owned. This was right. the document that we gave out to the developers just because we don't want to get in the nuances gotcha. of the difference. Okay. So it, it is our project to, yep. to deal with. All right, that was my question. Yep, the city council's authority pretty much stops at the tip and Yeah. All right. And site plan. If you can use uh, that LA way for parking or outdoor patio type thing as long as it remains open, is that uh, doable? Currently, uh, so the LA is, is going to be constructed this year as part of the Great Northern Project. We do have to keep it open uh, because of fire access to Great Northern. Uh, so the fire department needed 20 feet around the entire building. The uh, Great Northern building is uh, positioned further south along that alleyway, and so we wanted to make sure that if there was a fire emergency that the fire department had full access to it. So that alleyway will exist as an alleyway and will need to be utilized as an open piece. Uh, but anything off of the alleyway, south of it, um, <clears throat> you know, if you want to do a little bit of surface parking, uh, because it is a tight spot, I would expect, um, you know, if you're going to have a larger density uh, project, you'd have a first floor parking, uh, underground parking type thing here. Mr. Chairman, yes. Is that our wells? Our monitoring wells in that parcel? There's a few monitoring wells uh, actually in the corner of Mid State, and those, um, <coughs> not in the corner, my apologies, they're in the parking lot of Mid State. I don't believe there's monitoring wells in municipal lot number eight, uh, and there's some additional monitoring wells uh, in the public service site, which is southwest of, of this specific site. We do know, I mean, that there is contamination here. Um, and it was pretty evident when Lullaby was constructed, we found some additional coal contamination, as this body might recall. I would expect that we're gonna find the same type of contamination um, on municipal lot number eight uh, that we found at Belkey and at Lullaby. It's just part of the course for this area. Other questions? Your wishes. What's the question before the board? What's the, I guess, what are our alternatives? Uh, well, um, you really have two options. Uh, do a request for proposal or, uh, well, you have three options. Do a request for proposal, instruct staff to work with whom we believe would be the best option, uh, or leave it uh, kind of as an open space, um, just knowing that it is likely the city council is going to issue an RFP for the Edgewater Manor site for redevelopment, too. Um, so which side of the Edgewater Manor. Edgewater Manor. Um, so uh, those would really be the three options and, and what we're looking for direction on. Uh, you know, we do have an opportunity. We do have, uh, you know, three folks that have expressed relatively serious interest in doing a project here. Um, and I think it's probably worthwhile to do an RFP to get the best bang for our buck, if you will. I would tend to agree. Do we have a motion? Shall I make a motion? <laughs> I have a motion by Commissioner Gardner. Do you need a second? I'll second. Yeah, my motion was to support the recommendation of staff. To issue an RFP? Yes. Yes. Okay, second by Mary. Any other discussion? My only comment was mm -hmm. be careful what you ask for. You start digging around in this site, and. Um, we may, as I say, if you look at the photos of the way that pipe was filled, you're going to find some things that um, 
you don't expect. And I, I guess that's to be careful what you're looking for. I've been told there's bicycles and uh, all sorts of fun stuff. You've got the photos monkeys. in the office. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, valuable antiques. It's a, yeah, it's <laughs> filled with whatever well, they had available at the moment. We, we, we yeah. would, uh, and we had a conversation with Stantec this morning, who's our environmental well, consultant. Uh, you know, we would have them do a phase one, yeah. which I can almost guarantee would trigger phase two, uh, where we would do actual uh, test wells. Around the pipe, just to verify what would be down there. How's um, the parking issue working out for the uh, apartments to the east? Uh, they haven't had any issues. They have not any. Right. Other questions, comments? Director will take the roll. Slice. Aye. Gardner. Aye. Nebo. Aye. Cooper. Aye. Cavender. Aye. Barrett. Aye. Six zero. Motion passes. Number eight, enter into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85 per N1 per NE for deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, <laughs> investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business, whether wherever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session related to the following. One, discussion and update on possible development agreement for a property located within TIF Tax Increment Finance District Number 10, 1200 Main Street. B, a discussion and update on possible development agreement for property located within the tax increment finance district number 10. <clears throat> and C, discussion and possible action and acquisition of property at 217 2nd Street. Uh, we may or may not reconvene an open session at the end, depending on the discussion. We get a motion to go into closed session, Gene? I move that we adjourn into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't second. have to read and bore you guys Dave. again. We have a motion and a second. <laughs> Director will take the roll. Slice. Aye. Gardner. Aye. Nebone. Aye. Cooper. Aye. Cavender. Aye. Barrett. Aye. Six zero. We are in closed session. Wait a minute. All righty, we're back in open session. Um, looking to take action on acquisition of property at 217 2nd Street. I move we uh, acquire the property at uh, 217 Second Street. We have a motion and a second. For, for, for how much? And you probably want to include that. Do we want to quote the exact amount for $5,000? Sure. Okay. I'll we'll include that, that in the motion. John will second that discussion. Director will take the roll. Slice. Aye. Gardner. Aye. Nebo. Aye. Cooper. Aye. Cavender. Aye. Barrett. Aye. Six zero. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you for taking time out of your day to Close help the city grow with the redevelopment authority. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.